Okay, so hello everybody and welcome back to the GADMAC 23 conference. Um, this is brought to you with partnership um, with the Animal Evacuation uh, New Zealand and our platinum sponsor for Paws International. Um, our next session is presented uh, by Anna Ludwig and it's about the stories from the front line of animals caught in the Lismore floods. Um, Anna leads the Lucy's Project, which is a fabulous charity, and uh, I certainly recommend uh, you look, look up the details of what work they do. It's uh, actually fabulous, and hopefully Anna will say a bit about that during her presentation as well. Um, before we start, I just want to give you a few housekeeping points uh, in case you're just joining us for the first time this morning. Um, the chat uh, Zoom, sorry, the Zoom chat function has been disabled. Um, so if you've got any questions, please ask those in the Q&A section and we'll try and find some time at the end of this presentation to get to those questions. This year we've enabled the multilingual closed caption function. So if you want some help with translation, please um, you can click on the closed caption um, logo at the bottom of your screen and select uh, some help there. We also encourage you to use social media and use the hashtag GADMACConf on Twitter and other social media and just let the world know that we're out here um, uh, doing our thing. And uh, then finally, just to let you know, we're also recording these sessions, so they will be available later um, when we've got uh, everything sorted. So they will be available for you as well. So thank you. I'd just like to hand over now to Anna and just um, let you have the floor. <laughs> Um, and well for bringing this conference together it's, it's something quite amazing. My name's Anna Ludwig and today I'm just going to be sharing a few of thousands of stories from the animals that were caught in Lismore's floods. I can't hear all of them um, obviously uh, and many of them are very very hard to tell but it's incredibly imp important that they're shared. Some of these stories are, are quite personal um, and some are taken from um, stories are told to me and some I've taken from the media because many people decline to be interviewed for my presentation. They've just spoken about this so much, but they still want their animal stories to be told. And I don't want to be re-traumatising anybody. Um, so be very careful how we've collated these stories. It's just important today that I'm a voice for the animals um, and that we don't forget that their story is very much ongoing. There's no graphic images in my presentation, but still take care of yourself if this presentation causes you any distress. Today, I'm in Lismore, which is on the east coast of the country that you know as Australia. And to the traditional owners, this country is known as Bundjalung country, and it's the traditional home of the Widjibal Waiwa people. I'd like to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and that it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I pay my respects to elders past and present and the wisdom that they continue to share with us about these lands. Lismore is a strong, beautiful community. It's resilient in, in an area that is known as the Rainbow Region. We are spoilt with some of the most amazing and diverse natural wonders, flora and fauna. We've got koalas and, and wallabies and, and kangaroos and lorikeets. We've also got a strong agricultural um, community here and a lot of horticulture. Um, I'm having some tech difficulties here. Uh, with, as I was saying to Mel before, with um, trying to use a PC when I'm used to a Mac. So excuse me that I can't actually get to my notes. Um, I just also really wanted to highlight that, you know, we have a we have a mix of people. It's a real a real mixing pot of people this age, and a lot of socioeconomic disadvantage and very very high um, pet ownerships. But it's the way that we come together as a community um, that's actually managed to to really help us through these floods is to come together and to act as a community. And um, I also have a gnat in front of my face. This is not a time for gnat animals. Um, and I just want to share that for us, there, the damage caused by the flood is ongoing and that the crisis is far from over. But we're the Center of Lucy's Project. We're now a 10-year-old charity listed on the Prevention of Harm Registry. We're grateful to our major partners, the New South Wales Government, for their financial support of our work. And we also rely heavily on donations, memberships and partnerships. Now, our work is that we build capacity in the domestic and family violence sectors and animal rescue service sectors by removing obstacles to safety for people with animals experiencing crisis. 
Our mission is to improve safety and long-term outcomes for people and animals experiencing domestic and family violence. We know that natural disasters increase the rate of domestic and family violence and that crisis support can become incredibly complex during these times. But one of the biggest hurdles that we face in all areas of our practice is that animals are forgotten in safety planning. We aren't remembering the human animal bond and that neither a natural disaster nor domestic and family violence can break it. Preparation and response to crisis has to be more than just about the initial crisis period. It's about more than the hero at the time of the event. It's about the many heroes that support a family through the difficult times that follow. Lucy's project believes that safety planning starts before a crisis and must extend throughout the crisis right up to the point where they can say they have a secure, safe family, pause and all. The floods in Lismore showed us we were not prepared, neither for animals nor for humans. For a town as accustomed to floods as we are, this took us a bit by surprise. On, the Fe on February 28th in 2022, our small city of Lismore and the Northern Rivers region of New South Wales was hit with the first of two devastating and catastrophic floods. Old timers knew this flood was coming and that it was going to be big, but government warnings minimalised the risk, denied local knowledge, uncertainty was rife. When the levee that protects our city was overtopped, it came without sufficient warning, minim, um, came without sufficient warning and took many by surprise. Many who thought they were up high enough and were executing tried and true flood plans found themselves and their animals scrambling through ceilings and then cutting through roofs to sit in the pouring rain and watch their city and everything in sight submerge. Social media was essential to the survival of many, with emergency services overwhelmed, access cut off, the urgent pleas for help saw local heroes jump in their kayaks and small boats, inflatable rafts, whatever they could find to support anyone they could save. And they were saving humans and animals, any animal they could pull in for, for many of these people. Many had just lost everything they owned themselves. The floodwaters that hit were up to 14.7 metres high. To put that into context for people who might not be in the metric system, that's like the height of seven adults standing on each other's shoulders. Houses and buildings in Lismore are designed to withstand major floods, considered a height of nine metres and over. Many places are safe up to 11 metres. Nowhere in town is safe at almost 15 metres. People describe the speed of the floodwaters like a tsunami hitting. The water came up higher and faster than ever expected. Five people were killed, 30,000 people across the region affected, countless animals lost their lives, were injured, traumatised or displaced. Every vet surgery in town devastated. Cow cows, dogs, horses caught on roofs, up trees, stranded on balconies and injured. Snakes swimming through the water trying to find high ground next to the terrified people and animals clinging to the rare high points available. People were, watched their horses and dogs and cats washed away in floodwaters, powerless to help them. People and animals made refugees as their houses were rendered unlivable. Some even washed away in the torrents of water, watching entire houses and community centres washing down the main street of town. An exhausted and overwhelmed animal rescue network, many of whom had lost their own property and infrastructure, struggled to cope. There are stories of people trying to swim their horses to safety, cattle stranded on tiny islands of, I should say cows stranded on tiny islands of dry land, small pets washed away in their cages, a chicken who'd been locked in a tent managed to survive as the tent was discovered it could float and the, can, and the chicken was able to survive its strange little camping trip. Stories of people such as Claire and Courtney Wright, who'd moved their horses and cows to high land, close to the house and well above expected flood levels for safety, then forced onto their hay shed roof as water overtook the house, trying to block out the sounds of their animals drowning as they shared a, a set of headphones they're sitting up on the roof. Animals had put in a truck high enough that they could still breathe, then forced to stand in belly deep water for three days as the flood water refused to exceed. The first few days and weeks were bleak for animal rescuers. At first, it was a story of patching together whatever supplies and resources could be gathered in challenging and heartbreaking conditions. Dr. Bruno Ross was one of the first vets on the scene and is scathing the immediate response to animals, describing it as blatant animal cruelty. 
due to the slow response from agricultural departments. It was a very strong sense that we were on our own. He was initially focused on euthanasia and getting to as many animals as he could using borrowed boats and private helicopters. The lack of immediate response and preparedness for animals and humans is a message echoed across all sectors. Dr. Bruno Ross and Dr. Le Oliver Liao led a team of local vets to assist with larger animals. There was amazing communication between vets and animal services in the community, led by a community responding to immediate need and largely on their own in that first week. Vets have done an amazing job, tell a very positive, different story on their website of the months that followed this initial period. They say the local land service communicated well and gave us assignments to different places and farms. It was a shining example of efficient and professional cooperation between government and, and professional NGOs. I'm so glad to hear that they've had this experience. They assisted the Department of Primary Industries and Local Land Services of New South Wales Government with 43 volunteer vets and nurses for New South Wales and Victoria with triage van donated by Animals Australia, two four-wheel drives, and they tended to the local evacuation centre with over 200 cats and dogs. They treated animals large and small right across the region in extremely difficult circumstances. We were so grateful for the amazing help we received from mobile vet trucks with staff on hand from animal organisations such as Vet for Compassion and the Animal Resource Cooperative ARC or ARC. ARC did a marvellous job with food handouts and practical on the ground support for hundreds of animals. Ours is a community that knows how to come together in a crisis and we're forever in debt to those amazing volunteers and community members. I know I've missed a lot of animals and vets that, and including um, the Animal Welfare League and Northern Rivers Animal Services and a lot of others I know that I've missed and, and I'd like to thank all of them, even the unspoken ones, for their amazing contributions. This is one of my heroes, Lucinda Dyson. And I honestly don't know where Lismore would have been or will be or would be without her. And during the flood, we almost found out. It's quite emotional for me, it always will be. Lucinda runs a pet shop in town, but is always focused on rescue information, responsible animal ownership, and is a beacon of hope for our community and, and especially for disadvantaged parts of our community who might not have anyone else to turn to. Lucinda set up a cat rescue charity called Kitten, Cats in Traumatic Times Emergency Network in 2019 and has rescued hundreds of feral, stray and unwanted cats, rehomed them responsibly. Although it's a cat rescue, she's taken in dogs and horses and llamas and chickens and birds and any animal in need. She's one of our unsung heroes and a true voice for animals. I met with Lucinda to discuss this presentation and surprised myself with the force of emotion I felt again at how close we came to losing her. When the floodwaters were rising, Lucinda knew she needed to evacuate, but she was prepared. She's no stranger to these things. She had a storage shed in an area that had never flooded before. She moved all her stock and rescue cats to the shed. She was pretty pleased with herself and her flood plan and a warm bed for herself and her 23 cats or 22 cats she had with her. Some were like what we call feral cats that had never been handled and had been homeless before the flood that she'd taken in and, and some were young and some were kittens and some were rehomed. And the last thing she saw, saw before she turned off her computer was the floods were uh, supposed to be much lower than previous floods with plenty of metres of safety for her. But by 4am, the water was lapping, lapping at the mezzanine level of the shed and by 4.30am, she was ankle deep in water. Um, she moved all the cats into carriers and stocked them up as high as she could on her stock. But by 9am, the stock was inundated. And so she let the carriers, um, she opened the door to the carriers and let all the cats loose. She found sheets and towels floating in the water as she swimmed around, locked in the shed with no way out, and tied them to the ceiling so the cats had something to cling to. She placed the cats as high on the rafters as she could. Meanwhile, she was using social media to call for her rescue. She had to get out before the whole shed filled with water. As the cats fell off their rafters, Lucinda would swim out to them and place them as high as she could in the ceiling cavity. The cat, she says, the cats were incredible. Considering some were feral, they allowed me to pick them up and swim with them and hook them onto things. I didn't come out with a single scratch or bite, not a single one. They just knew. When she was finally rescued, her friend Jason, who'd risked his life to get to her, used an angle grinder to cut through the roof 
um, moored his boat on the roof and then used an angle grinder to cut through to pull her out. And as, it, as he pulled her out, a cat she called Big Cat jumped out with her and they pulled them both into the boat and took them off to their emergency accommodation. She'd only just met this cat um, the day before and despite the terror of the situation, the loud noises, the roar of the outboard motor, the driving rain, the cat stayed with her the whole time. Um, and so she went to the emergency accommodation and, and Jason actually jumped, jumped back through the hole and, um, and pulled out as many cats as he could. And she heard that were, he'd saved eight cats. And, um, and in the end, amazingly, only one cat sadly died and every other cat was ultimately rescued. That truck was an amazing help to Lucinda as was the box of veterinary supplies that one of the flooded vets had managed to box up before they were inundated themselves. Lucinda's cats were lucky because none had sustained major injury, but the cats that did survive were used to a raw food diet and became very sick on the dry food they had no, no choice but to eat. They housed 18 cats in a single room and they had to use whatever they could find as kitty litter. Lucinda says the cats cope better than the humans with the whole situation and there was not one cat fight despite the cramped conditions. The cat, the cat who stayed with Lucinda uh, was, uh, stayed with her. She was transferred through multiple emergency accommodations over the next three months until she'd get back home because landslides had cut her off. But Big Cat was ultimately adopted by Lucinda's friend and now lives a life of luxury and decadence, um, making Lucinda proud and happy. He deserves no less, she says. Lucinda recounted the amazing story of a family who fled the rising floodwaters, getting out with their three cats. Soaking wet and having lost nearly everything they own, a boy and his mother stood with three cat carriers in hand in an emergency shelter. The mother's mind turned to practical matters and now they'd overcome the first hurdle. And he said, this 14-year-old boy said, don't worry, Mum, it's all sorted. Thinking he was a bit, you know, confused about what they were going through. She didn't understand what he was saying and he explained, Mum, I shoved the kitty litter trays at the bottom of the carriers and made Ziploc bags with their identification papers so that if we got separated and someone found them, they could be returned to us. Um, he'd also made Ziploc bags and put kitty litter in them, the dry food and food pouches in another one and their medications so that they wouldn't get wet. So that they wouldn't get wet. And each cat had their own survival package in their carrier due to the boy's quick thinking. Mother was amazed and emotional, but the boy said, Mum, they are our family. We take care of them. When he tipped out his own bag for items he'd packed for himself, he'd packed a pair of dirty trousers and a change of underpants. A month later, another major flood devastated the region, destroying all attempts at recovery from the biggest flood in 100 years. We know floods, but this wasn't normal. The triple La Nina, a rain that fell sometimes around 500 millimetres or 21 inches approximately in a day, in a single day. The impact on wildlife has been devastating. Local wildlife hospitals work day and night to help traumatise and injured wildlife. And of course, we will never know how many lives were lost. Throughout the floods, local vets and animal services were amazing. But one of the things that I noticed in these immediate images that were, were coming across to us constantly is it wasn't the flat screen TVs or the gaming consoles or even family photos of, 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 heir, of heirloom photos that people were saving. It was their pets. Echoing that image of the, you know, that, that uh, story of the 14-year-old boys, people were saving their family members first. They were saving their animals. They were saving whichever animals they could. Nobody could stand to see an animal die. We know that in a crisis, it's in so important to say what matters and what matters when we're planning is it, we can't minimise how important uh, animals are to people in a crisis and the lengths that they will go to to save their family members. Animals are critical in emergency safety planning and I want us to recognise that we cannot ensure the safety of humans if we fail to, to, fail, fail to plan for the safety of animals because humans are going to put themselves at risk to save their animals. And if we're not adequately providing for the animals, we're not adequately providing for any of the humans that are involved in these crises. We, people are inextricably bonded to their animals and they will not leave them behind to experience domestic violence in their loo any more than they will, scrap, any more than they will leave a dog to drown on the roof in a flood. 
Animal protection is a whole of community responsibility. Many of the rescuers took animals with them if they could, and many of them were trapped on roofs and refused rescue until they could be rescued with their animals, even if it put their own lives at risk. They weren't leaving their family members behind. This family waited four hours to be rescued, hanging on to um, roof guttering, and they made a patch they would go down with their pets um, if they weren't rescued together. The immediate toll on animals was dramatic and huge, but it didn't end when the rain stopped. The story of flood survival is still very live. This is my pony. Um, actually, there's all of my ponies at that time there. This little one here in the, in the photo on the left is the night sparkle twinkle toes. He was on a jismet when the flood water started to rise. I contacted the property owner concerned that he might be at risk. She told me not to be a worry wart and that they weren't in a flood zone. A few hours later, the whole property was underwater and midnight was uh, sheltering in a granny flat terrified for the next three days. I couldn't get to him, but luckily they had dry hay and he survived. The horse that I brought home was traumatised, nervous, but recovered physically. I thought he was safe. It rained almost constantly for about six months after the flood and it was a tough time to be in Lisbon. No one could control the weeds that, and, and the new varieties that sprung up. Midnight and my other two horses decided to try the new weed. And Midnight and Joey died a sudden death with no warning on May the 3rd this year. We lost our friend, a part of our family that can never be replaced, my children's buddy. Weeds are one of the many flood stories that affect animals post-flood and, and control of them can be extremely difficult and prolonged. Wildlife and cows are particularly at risk. I've been finding deceased kangaroos and bandicoots that have also eaten this same weed and doing my best to raise awareness of just how dangerous this weed is as it springs up absolutely everywhere, prolifically in our region, working with um, the DPI and, and government departments to see if we can raise awareness and control this weed. There is a very real hyacinth crisis in Lismore now with no end in sight. This has forced many people to surrender their pets, even though it's almost 18 months of trying to stay together after the, after the floods. This, for Lucinda and others in animal rescue, has been the hardest. Until 10 days before I interviewed them in early, um, in early August for this presentation, early August, early June <laughs> for this presentation, they had not had one single adoption, only surrenders. The local animal refuges are entirely overwhelmed. The unwanted animals post the, COVID, post the COVID lockdowns had already overwhelmed shelters who now had to house animals in local shelters while simultaneously um, had to house the floods. Sorry, I stuffed that up. They had already been full from the COVID, um, from the COVID lockdown animals um, and then they were, they were full from the, the um, floods and from the housing, the rental housing crisis. And there was an unprecedented number of animals in local shelters. Beautiful animals are just not getting adopted because people don't have anywhere to house them, the local shelter animal rights and rescue say. Lucy's project hearing of animal shelters with a nine-month waiting list for intake. We hear of shelters turning animals away every day just because they don't have capacity anymore. Heartbreakingly, we're hearing of healthy animals being euthanized because there's nowhere for them to go. And while we face on the and while we focus on the critical basic survival needs of a traumatised community, the needs of animals are not getting enough attention and people do not want to be housed away from their animals. The floods wiped out a lot of affordable housing at a point in time when there was already not enough rental stock on the market and insufficient pet-friendly rental accommodation. Add this to homeowners who can't return to their damaged homes and have no idea if or when it can be fixed. Many have maintained animals remotely and simply just don't have the resources to do that anymore. But one, of the, one of the biggest problems that we have in this country with rental uh, accommodation is there's no default position, except in Victoria and, and Queensland where animals are allowed in rental properties. So people are finding rentals, but they can't take the animals with them. Uh, Lucy's Project and many organisations are working very hard to change that story. 
Um, we need to ensure that evacuation facilities can accommodate animals no matter where we are. And one of the problems that as well that people identified a lot is that animals were washing away and they never found out if they'd survived or they're okay or if they were ever found because, you know, we don't have a, a, like a database of, of large animals so that people can find an identification in, uh, information, which was something I really picked up in our last presenter's presentation is so critical to large animal owners to ensure that they have all that information at hand in advance of the crisis. You know, we need to be looking at systems to ensure that we can uh, let people know what's happened with their animals. And we need to understand that people need to stay with their animals right throughout the crisis, not just in that initial phase, but right to the point that they're in permanent safe um, accommodation together. Look, thank you so much for listening uh, to my presentation today. If you'd like any more information about our work or to get into contact with us, please look at our website, info uh, at lucysproject.com.au or email me at info at lucysproject.com. And if I had one message for animal responders, it's just to keep remembering animals, to keep talking about animals and to keep that awareness of animals live throughout the entire uh, crisis response system. Thank you so much for your time today. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Anna, for that moving presentation, um, as you know, um, because you were party to helping me and the team that was doing the research up there. Um, you know, we spoke to a lot of people in the Northern Rivers area where you're coming from about their flood stories and uh, picked up a lot of animal related stories there um, and lots of behaviours and decisions that were based around people and their attachment to their animals. Um, and I spoke to Lucinda, as you know, as well, and, um, and it was quite moving to hear again her story and I guess the the courage, the bravery, you know, the, the safety issues around trying to re rescue those other cats that were in the building with her. You also reminded me of, um, you know, the sounds that people heard. We heard a lot about about those stories and, and how distressing that is for people and those things linger with people. Um, and we know there's a lot that still needs to be done. So I think I would like also to just acknowledge the fact that we know this is still an ongoing situation. You've done a fabulous job of uh, of telling us all about the rental crisis and, and you know, post-COVID and a whole lot of other things that have come back to just add to the challenges that are out there for people. Um, I haven't got any questions at the moment. Um, and in some ways, I don't know that I can really top top some of what you've already covered, really, with what you said. But I do think there is such a, a, a space for this storytelling um, and I'm hoping that, as always, that the more we can tell these stories and share them, the more we can actually you know, raise awareness. Um, we can encourage owners to consider what might happen and how they might be able to prevent these sorts of things happening for themselves as well. And I do think they have a place for that. And I'm glad that, glad, that GADMAC has been able to, to give a, a, a platform for some of those stories to be heard. And we'll, we'll continue to do work on this, as you know. So that's 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 good, too. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I was interested to know whether you're aware of, of any activities going on to try and promote more awareness um, or, or you know, it always feels so trivial to say it, but we know the importance of it, but the counting, you know, the, 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 if there's no records, there's almost no awareness that these things happen and there's nothing to work on and to improve from the next time. Are you aware of anything going on that's good in this, this side of things? Inquiries of any... Sorry. You so, no, it's just a delay on your audio, that's all. Yeah, see, I'm getting a bit of a delay from you. I'm aware of a lot of inquiries and a lot of uh, studies, but I'm not aware of a lot of results yet that I that I would feel confident to to speak about. Uh, I, there's, It's just such a massive scale of devastation. There's just so many different stories and research going on at the moment um, on so many different fronts that, yeah, I... I mm. It'd be really interesting to look at what was missing and to really do a lot of studies to see what's missing, what we haven't done and what we haven't recorded um, so that we can be more prepared for the next flood. We know there will be another flood. We're now currently preparing for drought, but we know that there will be more floods in this region. So, yes, it would be that's, that's a very good question. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, we don't have any further questions at this point, so I think we'll, we'll leave it there and uh, let people will get on with their day or whatever time it is for them um for us it's uh it's uh just around sort of one o'clock in uh lunchtime so i'm going to go off and uh, let this session sort of settle in and uh, think about what i've heard today i hope that those of you who've been with us for this last presentation and for the other presentations this morning have got something out of that um we've had some fabulous stuff and i can't wait to uh hear more about what's coming tomorrow as well so 